Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. My name is Ioana Dimostenus, and on behalf of Cyprus Youth Diplomacy, I would like to warmly welcome you to the online event, Youth of Cyprus celebrate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. We would really love to meet you all in person for this great celebra celebration, but the ongoing pandemic gives us no choice but to have as our top priority the safety of us as all. Therefore, we explored all opportunities that the miracle of technology is providing us in order to make this online event a real celebration. We might be apart, but we should always remember that we are all in this together. Cyprus Youth Diplomacy is a youth organization trying to include diplomacy in the relation since 2014. Therefore, today's event comes as no surprise to all those who know our work. Our main aim today is to inform all young people of Cyprus regarding the role of the United Nations, the importance of multilateralism and the challenges the United Nations and multilateralism face nowadays. The role of youth within the UN system will be also highlighted today through the promotion of the importance of the Security Council Resolution 2250 of 2015, uh, named Youth, Peace and Security. We live in a complex and interdependent world and the pandemic came to highlight even more existing inequalities and challenges such as the climate crisis, migration, gender equality and many more. But challenges of the international community are interconnected and therefore global challenges need also global solutions. We, the young people, are the ones to primarily believe that multilateralism matters. Partnership, cooperation, mutual trust and respect should be our top priorities in order to remain true to the values and principles of the United Nations. And young people have a great role to play within the United Nations system. This is the reason we decided to organize this event. We want to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations because the establishment of the UN 75 years ago was a historic moment for humanity and deserves to be celebrated. Also, the 75th anniversary comes together with the 60th anniversary of Cyprus as a United Nations member state, something that of course needs to be as well highlighted and celebrated. This is the reason we are truly honored that the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Cyprus, His Excellency, Mr. Nikos Christodoulidis, will participate in our event today with a keynote speech titled The Importance of Multilateralism, celebrating the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the United Nations and the 60th anniversary of Cyprus as a United Nations member state. Thank you, Minister Christodoulidis, for your participation in this very important event. We are beyond honored and thrilled to announce that the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, Mrs. Jayasma Grigramanake, will be with us live from New York in order to present her role and mandate as the UN Youth Envoy, as well as her work to support young people around the world. Young people of Cyprus will have the opportunity later today to send their questions directly to the UN Youth Envoy through the website Slido with the event code hashtag UN75Cyprus and have their questions un answered during the ongoing live streaming. Followed the presence of the UN Youth Envoy, we will have the opportunity to discuss the role of young people in multilateralism and why it matters at the live panel discussion with Mr. George Haronis, Associate Human Rights Officer at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and Mr. Menelos Menelao, Executive Director of Youth Board of Cyprus. Young people will have again the opportunity to send their questions and comments either via Slido or submitting them as a Facebook comment in the ongoing live event. When this online streaming is over, and most, more specifically at 7 p.m. Cyprus time, Cyprus Youth Diplomacy is organizing an online workshop under the title Youth Ideas and Proposals the United Nations We Want, with the participation of young people of Cyprus, in order to showcase the impact that youth can have in relation to the work of the United Nations. Young participants will have the opportunity to present their ideas and suggestions about the role of the United Nations and the role of Cyprus as a member state. If you would like to participate and have you haven't registered yet, you can find more information on our website and social media pages. Before giving the floor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Cyprus for his keynote speech, allow me to warmly thank the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Cyprus and the Cyprus Youth Council for being the supporters of, the, of this event, 
as well as the Cyprus Youth Board for being our sponsor and the Cyprus News Agency for being our media sponsor. Dear friends, thank you very much for being with us today in this very important moment for the young people of Cyprus. And now it's my honor to give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Nikos Christodoulidis for his keynote speech. Thank you very much. Allow me at the outset to express my warm thanks to Cyprus Youth Diplomacy CY for organizing this event and for their invitation to address this virtual conference celebrating the 75th anniversary of the UN. Prior to sharing my thoughts with you, I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate Cyprus Youth Diplomacy CY for their invaluable contribution to public discourse for facilitating young people's meaningful engagement in political, economic and academic discussions. Rest assured that your role in promoting the vision and views of young people in these fields is greatly valued. Dear friends, 2020 marks a special anniversary for the United Nations. On October 24, 1945, after six long years of brutal war and unprecedented bloodshed, the Charter of the United Nations was ratified and the United Nations was born. Today, we celebrate its 75th anniversary. Unlike its predecessor, the League of Nations, which was dissolved after 27 years of existence, having failed to deliver on the challenges of peace, the United Nations has managed to address this age-old question with a fair amount of success. Having started with 51 member states, it had grown almost fourfold to 193. It now encompasses 38 specialized agencies, programs and funds and has launched in its long history 71 peacekeeping operations covering every corner of the planet. The UN's achievements have been crowned with 12 Nobel Peace Prizes, the latest of which was awarded to the World Food Programme this year. In my presentation today, I will focus on a subject close to heart, multilateralism and specifically how it has evolved within the United Nations in the last 75 years, briefly touching on the cooperation between the United Nations and Cyprus and the importance of youth involvement in UN decision making and beyond. The Republic of Cyprus has been part of the UN project since its independence in 1960. Much has been achieved in coordination and cooperation with the United Nations, an organization which has also been present on Cyprus soils since the early 1960s, not only through UNFISIP, but also through UNDP, as well as a plethora of other UN agencies. My attempt tonight will be interdisciplinary, shedding lights on this subject, both from a historical and a political perspective. It is worth starting our discussion by looking at why the United Nations was created. It is eloquently summed up, I believe, by a legendary Secretary General of the United Nations and a great statesman, Mr. Doug Hammarskjöld, who in a speech in California on May 13, 1954, famously said, the UN was created not to make mankind to heaven, but to save humanity from hell. This view, in my opinion, is a perfect blend of idealism with realism informed by the sobering first half of the 20th century and its horrors. This very objective remains as relevant as ever. Looking back to the circumstances that led to the creation of the United Nations, we can draw the conclusion that it was those same circumstances that also enabled the image and establishment of multilateralism. In fact, the very system as well as the ideals of the UN are unimaginable without the concept of multilateralism, which by definition necessitates its participants to closely work together to ensure peace, justice and prosperity. World War I was a product of a multipolar balance of power system in Europe, which finally collapsed under the weight of intricate alliances and rivalries. The Paris Peace Conference, which ended the war in January 1920, resulted in the establishment of the League of Nations, an intergovernmental organization, the first of its kind, whose main mission was to maintain world peace. The diplomatic philosophy behind the League 
represented a fundamental shift from the preceding hundred years. However, the effort was due almost from the start, as major powers such as the United States opted out, with while others simply abandoned it as soon as it became apparent that it would not serve narrowly defined national objectives. Well, indisputably, it was the rise of Nazi Germany that brought the final collapse of this project. It must be underlined that the failure of many to buy into its multilateral ethos and to choose a different path was critical in its ultimate failure. It is a tragic reality that it took a second devastating world war for a new vision to emerge and for wiser statesmen to lend weight behind the only formula that could and would prevent a return to slaughter. That of international cooperation on the basis of clear rules and principles that will need to be collectively upheld and defended. True multilateralism was so born. In 1945, 50 nations signed up on changing course, making a historic commitment to work together for peace. On April 25, 1945, representatives of these nations gathered in San Francisco at the first United Nations Conference, initiating the drafting process for a charter which ultimately signed in June and ratified on October of 1945. The desire to settle conflicts peacefully on the basis of common rules has since been converted into a universal system of institutions in multiple fields – political, economic, social, environmental, just to name few. This system is centered on the values of the preamble of the Charter of the United Nations and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The same ideals also underpinned the European projects only a few years later, which led to what we know today as the European Union. Though the Union started as an economic project at its core, and this is also what its evolution proves, it is a project of peace through cooperation. Given the circumstances surrounding the United Nations founding, it was inevitable that the organization's primary mandate was in the field of peacekeeping. It is unquestionable that the Cold War often complicated this task and yet one only has to imagine what would have happened in all likelihood if the United Nations didn't exist during the Cold War era. Some important examples include the UN peacekeeping force that was put together to end the Suez crisis in 1956 during which the symbol of the blue helmets was born the United Nations operation in Congo in 1960, the largest ever at the time. Following the end of the Cold War, there was a radical expansion of peacekeeping duties. As the colonization unfolded, the United Nations membership saw an influx of newly independent nations as well as a shift in its, its secondary goals of economic development and cultural exchange. In fact, by the 1970s, the United Nations budget for social and economic development was far greater than its peacekeeping budget. The Millennium Summit, held in 2000 to discuss the UN's role in the 21st century, culminated in the adoption of Millennium Development Goals, a commitment to achieve international development in areas such as poverty reduction, gender equality and public health by 2015. It is true that progress towards these goals was deemed uneven and they were ultimately succeeded by the Sustainable Development Goals. In addition to addressing global challenges, the UN expanded into the sphere of networked multilateralism, engaging more with civil society and fostering a global constituency. While multilateralism is not called to mend the wounds of world wars as in the 20th century, there are substantial challenges that I believe can only be tackled through enhanced level of international commitment and multilateral cooperation. The United Nations has been at the forefront of a large majority of this. Cyprus, as a member since its dependence in 1960, has stood by the core values of the UN system as an active member and has been involved in numerous initiatives. I will outline a few. On the political and security issues, since the second half of the 20th century, the multilateral framework has proven essential in tackling issues relating to non-proliferation and nuclear weapons. 
It is precisely through the multilateral framework of the United Nations that avenues of negotiation exist to address these very difficult issues. Despite the fact that we have a long way to go on this, one cannot but wonder how dire the situation would be in the absence of this framework. In the field of peacekeeping and security, an area of particular inter interest to Cyprus, considering the 1974 illegal Turkish invasion and continued occupation, UN peacekeeping missions perform a vital role in both containing and on certain occasions even preventing the escalation of conflicts while also striving to protect civilians. UNFISIP, for instance, has been absolutely instrumental in the task of peacekeeping on the island. The benefits of its work cannot be overemphasized and its presence remains indispensable so long as the military occupation of a part of the Republic of Cyprus continues. As far as the international dimension of threats is concerned, a byproduct of globalization has been to spread their effects across the globe, meaning that gone are the days when countries could afford to attempt alone to guarantee stability regionally and internationally. Without multilateralism and respect for a rules-based international system, the risk of a full return to power relations and great power competition is all too great as it is a specter of an ending spiral of conflicts and strife. Cyprus, through its membership in specialized committees and fora of the United Nations, as well as of the European Union, has been steadfast in its commitment to the principle of international cooperation, lending its voice and tangible support to all relevant efforts seeking to advance this concept. To this effect, Cyprus is an active member on, of a number of international efforts, including the Coalition Against the Islamic State and the Aqaba Process. Cyprus has also actively contributed to the collective efforts of the international community for the destruction of the Syrian chemical weapons arsenal following UN Security Council Resolution 2118, serving as the host country of the support base of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, UN Joint Mission, and offering its infrastructure and facilities to other states which participated in this multilateral mission. Moreover, Cyprus facilitates the deployment of the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon by hosting its Maritime Task Force, whose primary task is the preservation of peace and security of the shores of Lebanon in a highly volatile region. Dear friends, I couldn't talk about the United Nations without briefly mentioning to what extent our membership in the United Nations has had an impact nationally in an array of fields. In 1960, we made our first request for technical assistance to the then United Nations Technical Assistance Board, which later became the United Nations Development Program. As a result, an in-depth study of the economic potential of Cyprus known as the Thorpe Report, was developed. This constituted the basis for the country's first development program. Since then, the cooperation between Cyprus, UNDP and the UN Development System has covered a wide variety of activities in many socio-economic sectors, from agriculture to industry, from macroeconomic sectoral planning and policy formulation to institutions building, from natural resources surveys to pre-investment studies, productivity improvement and vocational training. In fact, the partnership with the UNDP has involved almost the entire UN system of specialized agencies and offices, having covered numerous socioeconomic sectors. Cyprus itself has a solid presence in these international bodies and cooperation has become a two-way street with Cypriot institutions and experts being called upon regularly by the United Nations system. Many Cypriot institutions, which were originally set up with assistance from the UNDP and the UN system, such as the Planning Bureau, the Agricultural Research Institute, the Higher Technical Institute, the Hotel Institute, the Cyprus Productivity Center, and many more, are now offering their knowledge and experience to other countries. The strong bonds between Cyprus and the UN institutions continue unabated to this day 
with close cooperation with the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNICEF, UNESCO, UN Women, to mention a few with which we have worked in 2020. Dear friends, the UN is marking its 75th anniversary at a time of great disruption in the world, compounded by an unprecedented global health crisis with severe economic and social impact. The coronavirus pandemic and the ensuing health and economic crisis have presented additional challenges for the United Nations, which has had to deal with what, according to Secretary General Antonio Guterres, is the worst global crisis since World War II. The pandemic has caused, among other things, food crisis, worsening inequalities and weakening of health system. It has become a stark reminder that we need to cooperate across borders, sectors and generations. Our response will determine how fast the world recovers, whether we achieve the sustainable development goals and how well we handle pressing challenges, from the climate crisis to pandemics, inequalities, new form of violence and rapid change in technology. They are friends, but just when we need collective action more than ever, support for global cooperation has been flanking. The rise of nationalist policies that reject a global cooperation threatens the legitimacy and scope of the organization. In many countries, public trust in traditional institutions is in decline and relations between countries have been under strain. Reverting to isolation is, is not the answer. As tempting as it may be to blame multilateralism at times of difficulty, the reality is that it provides the only platform on which challenges can be solved and we must collectively work to strengthen it. Despite its shortcomings, the United Nations remains the only institution that brings together all the countries of the world under one umbrella. It remains front and center in meeting head-on the many and multifaceted challenges and threats that plague our planet. It ought to be self-evident that redoubling our joint efforts within this system is the only way forward. As for the Republic of Cyprus, even though reunification of the country through a comprehensive settlement fully in line with the UN Security Council resolutions remains our number one priority, in recent years we have embraced a wider foreign policy agenda. Our effort is to move beyond strictly national objectives and looking at how a more diverse polythematic approach can deliver solid dividends for the common good. In this context, utilizing Cyprus' unique characteristics, amplifying our geostrategic role and promoting a vision for our region are of course all crucial. An important component of this agenda is the creation of mini multilateral structures in our region, the Greater Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean, where we are working tirelessly to foster a network of trilateral cooperation initiatives whose overarching purpose is to create conditions of regional stability, security and prosperity. We cooperate closely with like-minded neighboring states together with Greece, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, the United Arab Emirates in the context of an inclusive, positive agenda where the most fundamental rule is adherence to the international law and good neighborly relations. The redrawing of the energy map in the region, done in full respect with international law, including UNCLOS, coupled with our conviction that the region's natural resources can be a catalyst of cooperation and synergy, has gradually become a driver of positive change and transformation well beyond the field of energy. Let me also note that during the pandemic there was close cooperation through these cooperation networks to tackle the health crisis. The promotion of respect of the indivisibility and universality of human rights as a screen in our constitution is also a foreign policy priority. Taking into account the needs to address global challenges, especially in the area of human rights, Cyprus has promoted initiatives on several issues, including gender equality, 
the protection of the fundamental rights and human dignity of the most vulnerable persons. At the same time, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has decided to establish an annual Human Rights Award for outstanding contribution in the defense of human rights in Cyprus. The award, which will be known as the Stella Sugliotti Award, is a tribute to the unique and multidimensional legacy of this remarkable figure in modern Cypriot history who inspires successive generations of Cypriots. Dear friends, on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the United Nations, the General Secretariat has launched the UN 75 initiative under the name Shaping Our Future Together to establish a global dialogue that will examine the main priorities of our, our era and look for ways to build a better future for everyone. I couldn't agree more. There is a substantial work ahead for all of us and this, this is a time for all to declare their unequivocal commitment to a vision of peace and prosperity. We cannot and must not rest on our laurels. Further progress needs to be made and the level of our ambition needs to be stepped up. I'm convinced that multilateral dialogue and international cooperation is the only way to go. This dialogue must include, of course, our youth, enabling the engagement of youth in formal political mechanisms allows them to act as multipliers, contributes to better and more sustainable policies, and contributes to restoring trust in public institutions, especially among the youth. We must build on the work that has been done with the support of the United Nations, the UN Youth Envoy, and civil society. But this much is crystal clear this time. This cannot be another example of excluding from the table the very segment of the population whose future we are actually discussing. Now, more than ever, political institutions and processes need to youth up. Young people are fully conscious about the importance of the United Nations for our rights and freedoms. As active members of the society, they benefit by the human rights standards set by the UN and also the programs specified designed to promote youth participation and opportunities. Cyprus is fully committed to supporting the continued engagement of the youth to the work of international organizations. This is why we are working on promoting the visions and views of young people in our foreign policy initiatives. By supporting youth activities, young people become human rights advocates and act as multipliers to promote the rule of law and participation of young people in their societies. For example, in the context of the trilateral cooperation mechanism with neighboring countries, we have purposely included in our action plans activities on the promotion of youth exchanges bringing this trilateral mechanism closer to citizens of our countries. Dear friends, the UN was created 75 years ago in the aftermath of the horror of two world wars with the vision of bringing countries together and international institutions to support them. It is now time for a younger generation to begin looking at how this vision can be transformed in a manner that safeguards our planet and ensures a viable, prosperous future for all humanity. May the older generation's wealth of experience be a guide in this process, leading to a renewed San Francisco moment. Thank you very much. So allow me to warmly thank Mr. Christodoulidis for his keynote speech and his support to the work of Cyprus with diplomacy, as well as his support to the young people to be included in the uh, UN structures further. So now I would like to warmly welcome Ms. Jayasma Gikramanayake, the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. So Ms. Gikramanayake was appointed as the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth in June 2017 at the age of 26. She is working towards making the UN a home to the youth of the world. Uh, Mrs. UN Envoy, this is, this is our great pleasure. Thank you so much for being in Cyprus, even on a virtual uh, conference. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for this great honor. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And um, 
I was quite excited when I received your invitation, Madam President, and and uh, I think um, I went had uh, in the past three years many opportunities to interact with youth from your country, except maybe for um, our young leader Burak, uh, who was in the class of the UN Young Leaders for Sustainable Development last year, um, and of course my colleague and friend George, who you will be listening to uh, in a in a little bit. So I'm very very excited to have this opportunity, and I thank you for the for to you and the Cyprus Youth Diplomacy Forum for inviting me, and your team and your efforts in preparing and hosting this as part of the UN 75th anniversary. I consider it a special privilege and an absolute favorite part of my job to be able to engage with young leaders around the world. This year, unfortunately, I haven't had the privilege as previous years to be able to travel and meet young people where they are. But um, regardless of the limitations, I'm glad we've found uh, a way to meet and, and deliberate online on platforms like these. And I uh, I, I really value this opportunity, therefore. Um, today, I want to first address the fundamentals. So what are we actually talking about? Who are we actually talking about when we talk about youth? Um, then I will go into how the multilateral system and the UN in particular can leverage the power and the innovation and creativity and expertise that young people bring to the United Nations. Um, not just today, but looking ahead into the next 75 years. And finally, I will tell you a little bit about my role, my office, and the work that we do, and how you can get engaged in some of these very important and exciting activities. So to get us started, I want to address um, one question. And I, I would also encourage you to think about it, because this is a question I usually get. Um, who is a young person? Or what is the age range of a young person? And this is uh, this is constantly a question that if you are somebody working in the youth sector, that you will be faced with. So this is my bread and butter because I work on youth all day, all night. But I also still sometimes struggle to answer that question. And the more countries that I visit, the more people I meet, um, like today, the more... Uh, contexts that I'm exposed to, I find it harder and harder to give a clear-cut answer. So young people, unlike many other unchanging sources of identity, like say ethnicity or race, is a transitional phase of life. So one that evolves and changes with the passage of time. Around the world, the social understanding of when you are no longer considered young are often tied to key life events. So in some places, you become an adult when you get your first job. In other cases, you stop being a young person when you get married or move out of your parents' house or have your first child. So in some parts of the world, in certain cultures, this happens when you're 18 or younger. And in some places, we see you are um, in your late 30s when these life milestones actually become true for you. So like with many areas of life, the concept of youth is also gendered. Young women, LGBTIQ young people experience these milestones differently due to various layers of gender-based discrimination. However, with all this context, for statistical purposes, the UN Secretariat recognizes or categorizes youth as anyone between 15 to 24 years. And the Security Council refers to youth as those who are between ages of 18 to 29 years. So as you can tell, it's not easy to come up with one definitive answer. But in my work, I work with young people from 15 to 29 years of age. Um, as a part of my work, I'm also often asked to describe the lives of young people. And I, I like to adapt this quote from Charles Dickens, which says, it's the best of the times, and it's also the worst of the times. The world today is home for over 1.8 billion young people. So closer to 90% of them live in developing countries where they are constituting a large proportion of the population. They are the largest generation we have ever seen, the most interconnected generation we have seen, and the most educated generation of young people in history. So it is really the best of the times to be a young person if you look at these factors. But 
even before the COVID-19 pandemic, over one in five of these young people were neither in employment, education or training. Mental health issues among young people were seeing an unprecedented rise. It's estimated that 408 million young people today live in contexts affected by armed conflict. And even though half of the world's population is under the age of 30, only less than 2% of elected members of parliament in the world are under the age of 30. And I saw that in Cyprus, for an example, only 1.8% of the members of parliament are um, lower than the age of 30. So these challenges may make me think that it's also one of the worst times to be a young person because of these challenges. This pandemic COVID-19 has really exacerbated these existing systemic challenges and it's becoming increasingly clear that the socio-economic impacts of the pandemic will disproportionately affect young people for years and years to come. The only way to build back better for the world's largest generation of young people to a more just, sustainable and compassionate world is to empower them in all their diversity and recognizing them as leaders and experts that they truly are. This means that our political institutions, our formal institutions need to effectively engage young people. And engagement must go beyond just giving young people a voice, but just hearing and understanding them and providing the support that they need to affect change, whether it's financial support, resources, or creating safe spaces online and offline for them to deliberate and express their views on issues that matter to them the most. The days when inviting young people to sit on a panel and tick the box as youth engagement are most definitely over. And it's very clear that by tokenistic participation, we cannot achieve empowerment and meaningful participation in any way. So the fact that I'm here today, for an example, as the UN's special envoy on youth and the youngest senior official in the UN is a sign that the UN as a 75-year-old organization is changing slowly of course but surely it is changing and two years ago in September 2018 the Secretary General launched the first UN system wide youth strategy for an example as another intervention to bring young people closer to the UN and with that and what I strive to do through my role is for the UN to become a global leader, an example in not just working for young people but working with young people in partnership. So to do this, we have identified five key areas for action. First, we aim to open new routes to engage and involve young people and amplify their voices. Second, to strengthen the UN's focus on access to education and health services for young people. Third, economic empowerment decent jobs for young people, decent training and job opportunities. Fourth, for the rights of young people to be upheld, particularly civic and political rights, because in the recent past, we've seen how young people's rights for uh, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly or political participation and civic engagement are being curtailed in the context of a shrinking civic space. And we want to make sure that young people are protected within these spaces and they can realize their, their rights. Last but not least, the focus on young people in conflict situations and humanitarian crises. So looking at young refugees, young migrants, those who are affected by conflict, and what can the UN do to make sure that they receive the attention and their unique needs and priorities are met even within crisis situations as conflicts and humanitarian disasters, crises. So young people have also been involved in formulating these priorities and now in its implementation and monitoring and review. So my job has really been to advise the UN Secretary General and represent him when it comes to formulating strategies like this and to also advise and guide the UN system and kind of coordinate the UN system and push them to now translate these broad goals into very concrete programs, initiatives, action plans at the country levels to support young people in those countries in, in a very concrete way. So not just consultations and, and you know, talking to young people when 
the UN feels convenient, but rather really going into the communities, listening to young people, their needs, but also bringing them in as experts and allocating resources within the UN system to respond to those needs and priorities that they bring to the table. And in the past two years, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've really tried to push internally for this accountability to be ensured for the implementation of the strategy. For an example, through a scorecard, we are currently working on sort of rating our different UN teams in countries, how they are working with young people according to this scorecard, just to also, you know, ensure accountability, but also give them a motivation and encouragement and put a little bit of peer pressure into actually taking this agenda seriously. We've also looked at some of the gaps that are currently in uh, UN's programming at a global level and tried to come up with initiatives to close those gaps and provide entry points to young people to participate in important processes. So for an example, this year, you know, the climate negotiations were postponed because of the pandemic and COP26 is now going to be held next year, not this year. So we work with partners like the World Bank, the COP26 presidency, um, UK and, and the pre-COP presidency, Italy, to uh, make sure that youth voices continue to be heard through a series called Youth for Climate during this year so that the momentum doesn't get lost before the next meeting of the um, of the conference of the parties on climate change on mental health we've seen how covid-19 really exacerbated mental health challenges among young people so we worked with unicef and who to con con um, to come up with a series called Coping with COVID and really helping young people cope with the first stages of the pandemic. We looked at marginalized groups like LGBTIQ young people, the unique challenges they face within the COVID pandemic, lack of access to health services, lack of access to peer support groups, um, the, the, the kind of abuse and harassment that was happening within the within their own homes um, to ind indigenous young people, to disabled young people, and really looking at these intersections of their vulnerabilities and the challenges of COVID-19. On youth peace and security, we've done a bunch of work in bringing young people into the peace negotiation table. So where peace agreements are being negotiated to give young people the voice they deserve and the seat they deserve. We've been working on the protection of young people through a working group to highlight what kind of threats are young human rights activists facing and what can the UN and the international community do to protect them and protect those spaces for them. We've launched programs like the Young Leaders Program to highlight a cohort of 17 young leaders every two years who are doing exceptional things in their communities from food to fashion to finance to business to promote the sustainable development goals in their sectors. Um, and internally also we've been taking a good look within the UN and seeing how unfair practices like unpaid internships are a, a, a real challenge for every young person from everywhere to access institutions like the UN. So for an example, it's an ongoing work. Many of our UN agencies are currently working on reforming their internship programs. But one of the things that I have done is to work with the UN volunteers to establish a fellowships program. So currently my office does not have any unpaid internships. Instead, we have fellowships that we offer to young people from developing countries who would otherwise not have the resources to come to New York or Geneva to do an internship paying out of their own pocket. So I, I really hope that these examples we are setting, the rest of the UN system will follow and that we will be able to move towards the direction of not just talking, but really walking the talk of youth empowerment internally with the organization as well. So these are some of the examples I just wanted to highlight in terms of not just coordination and the advocacy, but programmatically how we are trying to bridge some of the gaps but i'll stop here because i've spoken so much and i look forward to our discussion and to answer any questions you may have um, and to really hear from you what are some of your thoughts what are some of your recommendations how can we improve our work as the un to better engage young people particularly from um, your country and your region thank you very much uh, thank you so much for your very insightful presentation and uh, also thank you so much for your great work 
uh, because you are doing so much for the young people around the world and uh, we owe you a, a big thank you. So I have many questions that they come uh, through the Slido. So I would like also to invite attendees, young people of Cyprus, if they would like to address a question to the youth and you and youth envoy, that it's a great honor to have here with us. Just uh, log in to Slido website with the hashtag UN75 Cyprus, and you can send us your questions. So um, a question we have received is regarding gender equality. So is how we as young people can further promote gender equality. So if you can um, let us know how you work as the UN Youth Envoy for gender equality. Yes, um, I think I am definitely seeing a generational change when it comes to addressing this issue. Um, for an example, em empowerment of women and girls or equal inclusion of LGBTIQ young people would come as an afterthought uh, in previous years and kind of be seen as a very kind of tokenistic exercise to say that, okay, like we consider gender in this project or this program. But I like to argue that our generation and the generations after us actually understand the, the true meaning of equality among genders and that we strive to achieve a world where any person, regardless of the gender they identify with, are treated equally. For an example, um, I know for an example in my country, the word feminist, uh, like say 25, 30 years ago, or even 10, 15 years ago, actually, the word feminist was considered as a as a bad word or as a as a if you identify your yourself as a feminist, you are considered as some somebody like probably very aggressive and like not not really very, you know, um, taken very po in a positive way. But today, so many years later, I know so many young people who are comfortable talking about feminism and talking about what they are doing towards gender equality, uh, dismantling the stereotypes uh, of gender roles for men and women and, and really coming together as, uh, as, as equals. And this generational change, I think we need to sustain. And the way we can do that is first and foremost by adapting equality into our day-to-day -day work so if you are in your school in your university in your home really be able to work across or dismantle those stereotypes and myths and misconceptions that there are about oh this is what a woman should do and this is what a man should do and this is what an lgbtq person should do into really identifying each other as human beings secondly um change cannot also only happen through individual change. Some changes need to come at a systemic level. So we know that many countries still have laws and policies that are quite discriminatory. For an example, um, equal pay for equal work. Um, some countries, um, when it comes to land rights, in some countries, when it comes to laws re re related to gender-based violence, and these still remain um, with so many biases and discrimination towards women and girls or LGBTIQ people, like criminalization of LGBTIQ people, for an example. So if we want to achieve true gender equality, um, we need to work both at an individual level and at a systemic level where we advocate and vote for people who want to change those laws and policies to create an equal level playing field for everyone. So thank you so much, Ms. Kramanayake. So we have another uh, question that is also very relevant uh, to your work as well. Uh, what do you believe is the biggest challenge youth around the world have to face? And do you believe the ongoing pandemic has affected more the young people around the world? That's a very interesting question. I mean, let me, I'll couple the two questions because I do think that the COVID-19 and its impacts are going to be the biggest challenge for the young people in at least in the coming years. There is a sense and it has been said many times in you know press conferences and by doctors and by scientists that you know young people are immune 
to covid 9 not immune but they don't they they are not one of the most um, what do you say like most vulnerable populations say for an example old people are more vulnerable than young people to the to the pandemic and to the virus from a health perspective and while this is true i think covid 19 is more than a health pan health issue it's more than a health crisis it is it has become a social and economic crisis and i like to argue that it's actually young people who will be impacted most by the social economic impacts of the pandemic 1.6 billion young people and children did not have access to education because of school closures during the first few months of the pandemic some 300 million odd young people still don't have access to education even 9 months after the pandemic you know not in every country we have technology to be able to do homeschooling or e schooling or zoom schooling and there are so many young people being left behind there are young women and girls who are at the risk of not returning back to school uh, for an example refugee girls only 10% of all refugee girls were in secondary school before the pandemic and the malala fund says that after this school closures it's very very little of them will come back to school because when families are going through poverty when families have to prioritize out of the two children which one person will get the laptop to do the homeschooling or the the money to get the uniforms and books to go to school traditionally it has been the boys who would be prioritized and girls will always be expected to do the household chores look after their younger siblings and sacrifice their education so that the males in their family could uh, use the limited resources they have to get to get education so this impacts on education particularly for girls and young women has been has is going to be humongous and we saw this for an example during the ebola crisis in places like liberia and sierra leone teenage pregnancies skyrocketed child marriages skyrocketed and and all this is linked to heightened rates of poverty and gender based violence which we have seen have been impacts of covid-19 by this date and it's going to be for for the months and years to come so there is a huge risk of young people being disproportionately affected on the on the education side but also employment side many young people have lost their jobs i think this research that ilo did um, i really encourage you to 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 read it 13000 young people were surveyed by ILO with other UN partners and civil society partners and uh, many young people one in five one in six young persons have lost their jobs because of the pandemic and this is only the statistics that we know because we also know that many young people in developing countries were not even in formal employment they were in informal sector before the pandemic and we don't even have the statistic to say how many jobs were lost in the informal sector or what type of social security nets that they would have when it comes to securing employment again and re-entering into job markets so i think that um uh, the the impacts of the covid-19 pandemic is going to be more and more on on the generation of young people in ways that we wouldn't even see it today and that's why since the beginning of the pandemic we have been advocating with government so much to not reduce funding that goes into education and training opportunities and health services for young people because if you start moving those resources into now infrastructure and kind of subsidizing um sort of private sector or kind of focusing on other things except for the empowerment of the next generation who are going to take the burdens of the pandemics with them then we will be missing the point of really having this generation of young people rebuilding our countries and economies after the covid-19 so thank you very much for your present if uh, you would like to have some final remarks uh, for your time and if you would like to give us an advice as young people of cyprus how we can help your work uh, in empowering young people thank you very much and you are very right yona i think uh, 
this is the reality for many young people you know even we when we talk about a new normal and working online and and all of that but uh, even those of us who are privileged if we find it difficult to operate in this space imagine for young people who are not as privileged as we are so let me turn that into my advice and really encourage all of you to also if you have a seat at the table if you have a access to a certain space always bring in the voices of those who cannot be in that space with you and and sort of push your arms and create more spaces so more young people can come to the table um do not try to be a voice of the voiceless rather try to create spaces where those who already have a voice can come and raise their voice um so i think those are probably the best pieces of advice that i can give you but i want to thank you for being so active so proactive and um for being interested in the work of the un and being wanting to contribute to that uh, we often have various sort of you know projects and campaigns and programs running and we use social media as our best tool to tell young people about them and to get engaged so please do also feel free to follow my office on social media you can find us on at you and youth on voy and you'll see um when we share different opportunities on different topics and we would really like to have um as many of you as possible engaged in our work going forward thank you very much thank you so much mrs ikramanayake uh, and uh, we hope that very soon conditions will allow uh, we will have you in cyprus in person to meet the great work that uh, young of, young people of cyprus are doing thank you so much thank you very much and now we are going to proceed uh, to the youth panel discussion uh, youth for multilateralism the united nations we want and uh, i am in the very uh, i'm very happy to introduce you to our two panelists so we're going to have mr george costandinos haronis and uh, from the office of the high commissioner for human rights and mr menelaos menelao the executive director of the youth board of cyprus um for this uh, panel discussion so uh, welcome both thank you so much for being here with us and uh, for spending this time to discuss to hear together about the role of young people in um, in uh, multilateralism so before i give the floor to george allow, allow me to to say some words about george so george joined the office of the high commissioner for human rights in june 2019 as associate human rights officer coordinating a project focused on promoting human rights with and for young people He supports the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to implement the UN Youth Strategy Youth 2030 and is the office's focal point for inter interagency collaboration on youth and global level. Dear George, it's a great honor to have you here with us. The floor is yours. Hello, Kalispera. Thank you very much, uh, Ioana uh, and colleagues. It's uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, to be able to join you uh, virtually. Um, for this discussion, as Iona mentioned, I uh, I work for the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, or OHCHR. I've actually prepared a presentation, so I will go ahead and uh, share my screen. If you just give me a second, um, and I it was great to hear the words of the uh, youth envoy previously. So um, hopefully, I will be able to to complement um, some of what uh, the youth envoy mentioned in terms of the work of the UN. So, um, just very briefly, um, I would like to just say a few words about OHCHR, um, then to say a few things about youth rights or human rights of youth, and then tell you a little bit more about the UN and young people, uh, and then delve a little bit more into the human rights system uh, and youth more specifically. So the UN Human Rights Office, or OHCHR, as you may uh, know, uh, is the lead entity on human rights within the UN system. We were established in 1993 with quite a broad mandate on promoting and protecting human rights. Uh, we are part of the UN Secretariat, and the, uh, the office is led by the High Commissioner for Human Rights, currently uh, Michelle Bachelet, uh, former president of Chile and former director of uh, UN Women. Uh, our headquarters are based in Geneva. We also have an office in New York and a number of regional and country offices around the world. 
So um, in terms of our work on youth, uh, youth has actually been a fairly more recent uh, kind of addition or focus uh, on the work of OHCHR. We, uh, of course, work to support any uh, um, of the work of the Human Rights Council in relation to resolutions specifically on youth. And I will come back to that later on um, in my presentation. We have in our current management plan, which is kind of like our, our organizational strategic plan, um, identified young people as a spotlight population, which means that we're trying to intensify our work um, with young people and really shine a spotlight on some of the human rights challenges faced by young people. And in that context, we also currently are running a project on youth and human rights uh, until the end of next year, which is very much about working not only um, for young people, but with young people. As the Youth Envoy was also saying, that's really kind of um, the order of the day nowadays in the UN. We're really trying to make an effort that we work with youth and not only for youth. Um, and in that sense, the, the objectives of our, uh, our youth project at OHCHR are very much aligned with uh, the objectives of the youth strategy, um, which, the, with the youth, which the Youth Envoy talked about. So um, when we talk about youth rights, uh, a few things to, to bear in mind and to consider. So of course, all human rights treaties uh, apply to young people as, as they do to anybody else. Of course, there's the, the Child Rights Convention, which has a cutoff age at uh, 18. So uh, apart from that, once a young person is over the age of 18, and the age range can be a very complicated question as the youth envoy very um, well pointed out. Um, then uh, all other uh, treaties, of course, apply to youth. Uh, there's no specific instrument that is dedicated uh, to young people, but there are, of course, uh, at the regional level, different instruments. Um, in Africa and uh, the Ibero-American region, there are, for example, legally binding charters on youth. Uh, in the European region, unfortunately, or you know, uh, as is the situation at the moment, uh, there is not a binding. Uh, there is not a binding instrument, but there is a um, recommendation from the Council of Europe uh, Committee of Ministers. There's two of them that focus on youth specifically. However, as they are non-binding, it's you know obviously uh, can be more difficult to ensure implementation and follow up. Um, there has been a draft convention on the rights of youth proposed by uh, by Uzbekistan. Uh, this was initially put forward by the president of Uzbekistan at the 72nd General Assembly uh, in New York, and it is something that they have been following up on. However, uh, this is something which is at the discretion of member states. So basically, we as OHCHR um, are here to support member states uh, in, in any decisions they take to move forward with conventions. So it's really up to member states in, in that sense to, to deliberate and discuss uh, um, if that's an initiative they want to take forward and then to, to request the, the expertise and support from our office. In terms of challenges and discrimination, I think the Youth Envoy highlighted a number uh, of those. Um, and these uh, what you see on the slide here is really just based on a report conducted by our office uh, two years ago in 2018 at the request of the Human Rights Council. And uh, these are really some of the main challenges that we identified in relation to youth participation. So, uh, sorry, in relation to, to youth uh, and human rights. So the first one is to do with participation in public affairs. Um, as the Youth Envoy said, uh, there is a very low percentage of young people in parliaments and in Cyprus, even 1.8%. Um, there are, of course, challenges in transitioning from education to work, uh, accessing healthcare services, and conscientious objection to military service, um, as well as specifically for young people in vulnerable situations. I won't go into more detail on those now because the report is, of course, publicly available. I'm happy to talk to talk about it more, um, but uh, at this point, I'll just move on. So I think another thing that's interesting to consider is to really think about the, the social and cultural contexts around young people. And I think there are a lot of stereotypes and prejudice um, and this, I think, really is behind one of, you know, going back to one of the questions uh, posed earlier and on Slido, one of one of the main challenges is, is this kind of, um, you know, age-based, sometimes outright age-based discrimination, sometimes is a bit more subtle, and sometimes it's also related to the kind of the standing and the position of young people in society or to the roles they are expected to, to fulfill. Um, in uh, within their you know uh, in their society. So I've just pulled out here two quotes from uh, a study 
which was conducted uh, as the progress study on youth peace and security, an independent progress study. This was from a few years ago, just to showcase, uh, and these are quotes from different regions. So a young man from Tunisia said, for example, that even if you make the effort to change, society gives you an eternal tattoo, a label of an offender, a failure, or a source of problems. Um, and a young woman from the Asia Pacific region uh, highlighted that her government's main concern is keeping young people as quiet as possible and that young people have power, flexibility and voice, but not all governance are happy um, that this is the case. And I think this is just a bit, you know, um, shows, uh, reveals some of the challenges that young people are up against, which are really to do with with prejudice and stereotypes, which often link to um, to youth as as a whole, as an age group, and often sometimes are also targeted specifically towards uh, towards young men. Um, now, just to uh, give a brief overview, I don't want to bore you with frameworks and, and so on and so forth, but just to have a kind of complete picture. Um, the most, one of the most important frameworks for the UN on youth is of course the Youth 2030 uh, strategy, which the Youth Envoy uh, mentioned and which her office is doing a tremendous amount of work to, uh, to pull forward. Uh, that was launched in two years ago um, at a high level event by the Secretary General and the Youth Envoy's office is leading on that with support at interagency level. OHCHR is all, also very heavily involved in that. And one of the priorities there is looking also at, at youth and human rights. Um, there are, of course, other frameworks. I would say that all the, the resolutions, the three Security Council resolutions on youth peace and security um, also kind of provide a very solid basis and, and mandate for the participation and involvement of young people in peace building processes. Um, of course, that's very much more linked to the Security Council side of things. Um, rather than, you know, the processes we follow here in Geneva, but certainly relevant uh, to our work as well as there is very much links uh, with uh, young peace builders and young human rights defenders and protection in that sense. Um, there are other frameworks as well. There is a World Programme of Action for Youth, which was adopted in 1995, and there are biennial resolutions at the General Assembly and Commission for Social Development on that. Um, and there is also, this is a non-UN framework, the Lisbo Lisbon, Lisboa Plus 21 um, declaration uh, from last year, which was a co conference of ministers uh, 21 years after the original conference organized again in Portugal. And that's just to point out that there's a very strong basis in human rights for youth in that specific framework and in that specific document. Um, now, moving on to the kind of the, the next bit about young people and the, and the UN human rights system, I think um, there's two key elements to consider here. First of all, there's a question of mainstreaming um, issues, youth issues or youth rights into the work of the human rights system. So that's to ensure that the different mechanisms that exist are really addressing the concerns, the human rights concerns and the human rights violations of young people and really asking there the question, how effective are these instruments for youth? Uh, and then the second element is very much about youth participation in human rights mechanisms and systems. So more specifically in reviews and follow up. So where a state is being reviewed, um, whether that's uh, by a treaty body, which we'll get to in a second, or by other member states, that young people are able to be involved uh, in some way, shape or form before, during and after uh, that review happens um, and are involved in a meaningful way uh, to ensure meaningful youth participation uh, and follow up on those recommendations. Um, so this is just a visual representation of what I was just talking about. Uh, the two key elements on the one hand, mainstreaming of youth rights, um, and the second aspect, which is youth participation. Uh, and then just very briefly, um, this is, uh, you know, this is something we spend often hours and hours doing training courses on. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'll just try to be very brief and just explain how some of these different um, mechanisms or bodies address youth um, at the moment. So, of course, there's the Secretariat, which uh, where our office sits in. Um, and then under the General Assembly, there are the treaty based bodies, which includes the 10 human rights treaties. Uh, the, the treaty bodies, which are committees of independent experts that are established in order to monitor the implementation of, of the human rights treaties. And then there are charter-based bodies, which include the Human Rights Council, which is a body of 47 UN member states, um, which also conducts the Universal Periodic Review. Uh, and additionally, the Human Rights Council decides to appoint uh, mandate holders for special procedures, 
um, on specific topics or specific countries um, with, with a specific mandate to, to elaborate more on those issues. So looking at a few of these, um, the Human Rights Council, there has had three resolutions on youth and human rights. Um, the most recent one called for an intercessional panel on human rights challenges and opportunities for youth, which has been postponed due to uh, COVID for early next year. Um, and there has been a thematic focus on youth in terms of mainstreaming uh, across other activities of the council. So there are a number of other activities such as the social forum, the forum on minority issues, um, the forum on human rights, democracy and the rule of law, for example, where there have been instances or iterations of, of these fora that usually happen every one or two or three years where there has been a specific focus and, and dedication to youth. Um, in, term, in terms of the Universal Periodic Review, um, basically this is a, uh, a review uh, of member states by member states. So this is a review conducted by, the human, by members in the, in the Human Rights Council, or all states rather. Um, every single member of the United Nations is reviewed every four and a half to five years uh, by all other states, which put forward recommendations to, um, to, to each state, to each other. So um, there have been two full cycles where every state has been reviewed. Currently, we're in the, full, the, the third uh, cycle. But if you look at the recommendations in the first couple of cycles, specifically on youth, there is not very many. However, over the last years, there has been an increasing engagement of civil society and also youth organizations with this process, with the Universal Periodic Review. Um, and OHCHR has been working to uh, support with capacity building on engaging, uh, on engaging specifically with this process, as well as other processes. Um, the treaty bodies, which are the uh, independent expert committees, um, which uh, monitor the implementation of the human rights treaties, uh, also, you know, um, have let, um, this. This slide is looking a little bit about uh, at their work. The human rights treaties, the treaties themselves, do not refer to youth, but some of the treaty bodies have called for specific measures on young people. So the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, for example, has called for special measure, measures of protection and assistance for all children and young people. Um, the committees issue general comments, which are commenting on specific, often specific articles and delving into more detail on those articles in, uh, in the conventions. Um, but then they also conduct state reviews uh, so in some of those state reviews, they have addressed uh, they have addressed young people, uh, including issues around access to education um, and so on and so forth. The special procedures, as I mentioned, these are uh, individuals who are well, they're mandates that are uh, agreed upon by the Human Rights Council, and then individuals are uh, selected to to fill those uh, those positions. Um, there is no specific uh, mandate holder, no special procedure dedicated to youth. But again, as with some of the other uh, processes, uh, as you can see, there have there are some recommendations and thematic reports focusing on young people, um, and there are some, you know, some some of the special rapporteurs and independent experts who are these mandate holders have chosen to to raise specific issues and questions uh, around young people. So I think I'm gonna leave it at that for now. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, and interact. And I just thought, you know, if anyone feels like uh, answering also a question over to the audience we have here today, uh, just to ask in what ways you think the UN can work to more effectively promote the rights of young people. So um, I'll leave it at that. And I look forward to the, uh, to the panel discussion um, later on. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, George, for this very insightful presentation. And I think these kind of issues, they were arose for the first time in Cyprus. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm sure that they're going to be helpful for a lot of uh, young people um, on how the youth rights system works within the United Nations. And now I would like to warmly welcome Mr. Menelaos Menelao. He's a very well-known figure to young people of Cyprus and the youth sector. And we are all of us very grateful for his work. So for those that it happens not to know him, allow me to present him. So uh, Menelos Menelao has a passion for youth empowerment and social impact. He's a design thinking enthusiast, promoting innovation and new ideas. So Menelos' current goal is to lead the Youth Board of Cyprus and help realize its vision and mission, namely youth policy making, creating and providing opportunities for the youth of Cyprus to participate in the social, 
entrepreneurial culture and political growth of Cyprus, overcoming challenges and network across Europe and beyond. So I think he's the per person, the greatest person to be here with us and allow me also to express our gratitude because this event uh, is sponsored by the Youth Board of Cyprus and if it was not the sponsorship, it would not be reality. So thank you so much for your presence and the floor is yours. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Joanna, for the very kind introduction, the very kind words. Um, I thought that you were you are going to say that I am here because we are we are paying and we are sponsoring for the event, but uh, thankfully you didn't. So thank you for that. Um, anyway, um, I didn't prepare a presentation, but um, I, I will try and keep it short. My my intervention, and then I will give more time maybe for discussion and questions towards or or, uh, or the other panelists. So um, first of all, allow me to to thank you. Um, Personally, also the Cyprus Youth Diplomacy for the kind invitation to speak on this panel and to this event that uh, celebrates the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. I also, on behalf of the Youth Board of Cyprus, as the official and competent authority on youth issues and youth policy in Cyprus, I would also like to extend our gratitude to the UN Secretary General's Youth Envoy uh, for your participation. Uh, um, presence, uh, even virtually, as you said, in, in, in Cyprus. And uh, of course, Mr. Christo um, our Foreign Affairs uh, Minister, I think it is uh, of utmost importance that uh, youth initiatives like this one are supported and highlighted by the political ecosystem uh, locally and internationally. So, um, the question on the question, what role can young people, and more specifically young people in Cyprus, um, can play in the context of, of today's international scenery. So, uh, first of all, allow me to talk a little bit about this international scenery. What is it? I mean, what is like uh, right now the international uh, scenery? What is the scenery we are looking for? And, and then let's see what uh, young people can, can do about it. So, um, the international scenery, in my opinion, is one of, of great achievements and, and great challenges at the same time. We tend to focus more on the challenges, for example, the, the climate crisis or the health crisis, the financial crisis, conflicts around the world and so on. On the other hand, we are also living in times of, of great technological advancement, medical breakthroughs. World poverty is still a great problem, but the numbers of people living in extreme poverty have been reduced. More people are getting educated and many more positive developments are happening. We can have an idea of the scenery that we want by visiting the website of the UN and reading out the UN slogan, which is peace, dignity, and equality on a healthy planet. So this is roughly, I would say, the scenery we are aiming at, we are looking for, and we are looking to create. And this brings us to the million dollar question. How can young people contribute towards a peaceful world with prosperity for all? Uh, in a responsible and at the same time sustainable way. So I will start answering that by stating that, as the Youth Envoy said, young people are a very big percentage of the population right now. And I would say that it's too big to ignore, too big to neglect, and too big to let it underutilized. So I say this because many, for many years, and, and maybe still in many countries and many societies, youth are perceived as a problem or a risk rather at risk or you know part of the solution or as an asset to invest in and capitalize on and that needs a mindset shift that uh, is what we the youth ecosystem are trying to achieve through our work youth work and 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 so on and before going further into the specific answering the specific answer we also need to see where we stand as common ground, as common understanding on youth. Of course, youth is a diverse group of people. Young people have a different level of education, knowledge, quality of life, skills, and surely are facing different challenges around the world. Beyond different differences, though, we need to, to, to recognize that, as I said, some of the common ground for all youth, in my opinion, Common ground is the ability of all young people to actively contribute towards achieving and sustaining the international scenery we want. 
Another important commonality, I would say, is, there, is the ownership of the future from which their right to have a say in it stems from. So how can young people rightfully play a role in this international scenery? In my opinion, young people can do this if they have three things which I call the CSI success factor. Capacity, space, and impact. Now, regarding capacity, young people must develop their skills, their talents, build their characters, allow themselves to innovate, try and fail, try again. They need to participate, they need to build evidence, they need to showcase, and they need to advance their networks locally and internationally. They need to come together, know each other, understand each other, build empathy and love. Examples of programs that promote this kind of uh, capacity building is, of course, the Erasmus Plus program, European Solidarity Course, uh, the youth initiatives here in Cyprus, and so on. Now, the second phase, young people must secure a space where they can operate, where they can build their capacity, where they can safely express themselves, build their case, and show the world that they can do stuff, they can do things. This space could be a physical space, it could be a digital space, or a digital space. In any case, if this space is not there, one must demand it, one must raise a voice, so one is created. In Cyprus, I would say that um, this space includes, for example, the information and counseling centers, the youth multi-centers, the youth clubs, the youth maker space, the youth parliament, uh, the National Youth Summit, the Up to Youth TV show, and, and, and so on. The third factor is impact. This should be and will be, uh, hopefully, the outcome of the previous two factors. It is action. It is like the match day or the premiere of a theatrical show. We spend quite some time preparing, practicing, and then we do. We, we act upon. And this action needs to be visible and measurable and scalable. I, I personally, I see impact almost every day, um, from policy recommendations to program design and implementation. I saw impact during the COVID crisis, um, youth actively contributing in the fight against the pandemic, and we need more of that, and we need more impact. Now, the Youth Board of Cyprus is probably, I would argue, and I'm of course biased, but I think it's the strongest and most faithful supporter of young people's ability to have a positive social impact. All of our programs and services aim exactly at empowering young people to build capacity, to have the necessary space, and eventually to have an impact. Uh, personally, I believe that young Cypriots have the CSI factors so that they can play a role in the local and also the international context. Uh, how? Uh, in many ways. For example, the, the individual level or the youth organizational level, Currently, as you may well know, we are happy to see not one, but two young Cypriots participating in the European Youth Forum Board. A young Cypriot was, uh, until recently, the vice chair of the advisory council of the Youth Department of the Council of Europe. So young Cypriots, through their work and networks, can influence not only the local, but also the international context. Together with youth organizations, we have also organized uh, regional political youth forums on, on hot topics like democracy, radicalization, leadership, participation, and youth work. Moreover, in approaching the end of my intervention, I would like to say that Cyprus faces a long-standing conflict and this problem, an opportunity has arise for youth and youth organizations in both communities to develop their peace-building skills, their empathy, there are conflict resolution techniques and find ways to coexist and co-manage their organizations. Uh, one best practice is the home for cooperation. I think that Cyprus youth can play a major role in promoting peace and conflict resolution internationally, becoming the space where the capacity will be built for the impact to come and eventually getting to peace, dignity, equality, on a healthy planet. So thank you very much. And um, I'm open to any questions and discussion with um, the audience. 
Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the hard work of the Youth Board of Cyprus in order to empower young people. Um, and also it's great to see also young people fighting for young people. So uh, it, it, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us. So uh, I would like to invite people that they're watching us to send their questions like before through the Slido uh, website with the hashtag UN75Cyprus and address their question to our um, two panelists. So I have some questions that they already came in. So I think this one is uh, for Mr. Menelao. So how youth can play a stronger role in the local political context and what Cyprus Youth Board is doing to support or facilitate this? Hmm. All right, um, very, very nice question, thank you. Um, well, you know, I, I think we, we face a lot of as a society, as a legal system. I mean, you can, we can talk about, you know, the climate crisis, human rights, equalities, inequality. We, I mean, even more local problems like now, the educational reform or uh, changes in the legal system and, and so on and so forth. But um, these kind of serious problems cannot be solved without the participation and uh, in, in a broader sense, participation of young people, because young people can participate also as stakeholders, as uh, you know, the owners of the future. As I said before, uh, they can also participate, of course, experts because they are very well educated and uh, digitally um, natives. Uh, they are born in technology, so uh, I have a very strong, um, you know, opinion that. Our biggest problems can only be solved with the participation of young people. And that is the role that the young people should and, and must play. Now, for that to happen, they need to participate. They need to participate in, um, in, in many kind of, you know, in many different ways. They could, first of all, they should participate by voting. Uh, secondly, they should participate in organizing themselves in youth organizations. They can participate in, uh, uh, you know, building their, their capacity, as I said before. They, they can participate in by uh, being, um, you know, active online and, and, off, and offline like, uh, you know, activists. They, they can participate in many different ways. And our role as um, the youth board, I think, is exactly to find the ways, first of all, to inspire them to want to participate to showcase you know, role models within their own communities. Uh, other young people that do participate and, and have an impact uh, in, in, on a society, so in a society level, in a, you know, at large. So uh, in a nutshell, I think young people should participate. They have a very strong role to play. They have the skill set and they have the kind of character to you know, have a very strong impact on the big problems that we face as a society. And our role as the youth board and as you know, state at large um, uh, is to find the ways to inspire them and introduce them into the civic life and you know, prepare the leaders of the future. Thank you so much. And I would like to turn to George because I can because mm -hmm. European Youth Forum was mentioned. And George, as I can see on his on his CV, he worked as a senior policy officer on youth rights at the European Youth Forum. Uh, so I would like to ask you about: Is it different uh, to work for the youth sector about youth rights, and now to work on a um, UN office for youth rights? Is it conflicted? Or is it um, um, one like it's like a puzzle? I mean, you put the whole uh, the picture the whole picture together. So, how is your experience on that? Thank you very much for the question, Joanna. It's actually it's actually a question I had never really pondered before, but I think it's actually quite an interesting question. I I, I would say the experience is is very different, um, in the sense that you know in in my previous role it was about you know working 
um, basically as the as the human rights officer, as the youth rights officer of uh, an NGO and uh, working with the members of that NGO, which were which are youth organizations in Europe to um, to get them to, you know, support them in promoting the rights of young people, get them engaged in the human rights system. Um, and while to some extent that's also, you know, part of my job today, I think one of the things that's, uh, that's um, you know, that's really striking is is just you know how much it, it, sometimes it feels like you you have to explain internally. So as I said, um, the youth agenda is a slightly newer agenda and topic within the context of the work of OHCHR. We only a few years ago, two years ago, said that we want to um, spotlight youth uh, throughout our work, um, and I think you know there this this means that there is a long process ahead in terms of. Uh, institutional mind shift and really also mainstreaming youth across the work um, of the organization. So, you know, whilst um, working for the UN, it's, or in general, the UN is 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 not just uh, the work that we do in, in headquarters in Geneva or in New York. It's the, you know, the bread and butter of our work, especially in human rights, is very much to do with the work that we do on the ground, how we work with rights holders, how we support rights holders to make sure that they can um, exercise their human rights and address human rights violations um, and support them through that. Uh, I think a lot of what I see a lot of my work at the moment as well is is in terms of, you know, supporting and facilitating that institutional um, mind shift and change and trying to bring in that perspective um, that I have also from my previous experience um, in, in making OHCHR, you know, have a more concerted and strategic and consistent approach to the way that it deals with youth. I know it, it maybe doesn't sound very sexy and sounds a bit bureaucratic, but actually if you ask me um, what are some of the main differences, I would say that that's probably the most striking one that it's almost, it's not just about promoting the rights of youth externally as OHCHR and as the UN, but it's also very much about having that mind shift internally within the UN. The, the youth strategy uh, recognizes youth as rights holders, but this was only uh, launched two years ago and it will still be some time until we, you know, partners across the UN system get get really that into action and get uh, get get moving on that. So I would say that's probably one of the biggest uh, differences between my previous role and my current role. And of, co of course, we wish you every success in, the, in this very important role that you have now to promote youth rights within the UN system. So I would like, I'm very aware of the time and uh, I would like to have a last round of questions if that's okay with you. So I would like to turn to Menelaos and ask if the Youth Board has any um, decisions or, or initiatives uh, to work further with the UN system. For example, if I remember correctly, the Youth Board participates in the ECOSOC Youth Forum. And there are some more projects uh, about youth involvement, for example, the UN Youth Delegate, there are some other initiatives. If there are any plans to from the Youth Board uh, to elaborate further, and maybe also to take also a question that it was also discussed with the UN Youth Envoy, if there are any initiatives to uh, promote youth rights, for example, equal equality at work and to ban unpaid internships or to have a full framework regarding internships and youth work in Cyprus. Um, my, my connection wasn't very good, so I, may, I missed a couple of words that you, you said, but I think I, I got the question. So, um, yes, we have been working um, uh, for a long time with the UN uh, system. Uh, we do participate in ECOSOC, we do participate in various, uh, you know, a specific sum. So the last one was beyond ECOSO was the one on the on climate, where also the president of, of Cyprus was present, and also a youth representative was there along with uh, you know the relevant ministries and, and and so on and so forth. So our political decision is to enhance this relationship with the UN as much as we can. So we political decision is to find all the initiatives that we can you know participate in. Uh, we will extend our resources as far as we can in order to... So uh, one of the last, uh, you know, uh, big things that we're trying to organize, but COVID was, you know, uh, keeping us a little bit behind, was 
an initiative along with um, the Ministry of Education on the education of uh, sustainable development and you know sustainable development goals. Um, there is a special committee in the UN uh, working on, on this and we have only I think last week recently uh, appointed uh, the youth delegate on uh, education for sustainable development uh, the, the youth delegates that will participate uh, in the uh, relevant committees uh, of this initiative. So I think this one is a, a very important step because, as we all know, the uh, SDGs are, um, you know, the major goals of the UN uh, for the next decade or so. Uh, so our presence will only be beneficial for both uh, the youth board, of course, but the whole uh, youth ecosystem uh, in Cyprus. Now, uh, Regarding uh, the second part of the question, I think was on human rights and you know gender equality and you know all, all the spectrum actually of of youth rights in, in in Cyprus. That that was a question. Wasn't very sure. It, it was if there's going to be and what if we do. Going to be okay. A um, about well. So it was about the framework well, um, of... Uh, there is no specific framework. Ah, okay. Okay, now, now I heard you. So, well, we fully support, basically, the paid internship framework. So, uh, in the youth port of Cyprus, when we use internships, and we currently have... Uh, uh, one uh, one just finished and one just came. We always do paid internships. Uh, we also know that uh, European uh, the European Youth Forum was you know lobbying for the paid internship and fair price fair uh, internships in the European uh, ecosystem at large. The European Commission, um, uh, the Parliament, and so on and so forth. And only recently the European Commission agreed that they will follow this. Um, you know, lines of paid internships. And we will fully support that in Cyprus as well. We are in collaboration with labor, and uh, we will push forward this framework, the European framework for paid internships. And not only that, we will also uh, push forward collaboration between academia, you know, the universities, and uh, the labor market, because this is a discussion Held for a long time now that internships should be introduced in the curriculum of um, you know the academic departments in the universities, and it should be done in a way that both the academic idea will be satisfied, but also the paid internships framework will also be satisfied. So this is another role that we will play in the near future, the next few months. So that's amazing news. Thank you so much for sharing them with us. And now I'll ask a question to George. Um, do you believe that the current um, system that exists protects enough youth rights? Or because you told us about also about Uzbekistan's uh, initiative on having a, a convention on youth rights, or shall we do more to make sure that youth rights are protected and do we need a convention maybe? Thanks for the question, Ioana. I think, um, you know, the as as uh, as OHCHR, our position is is a bit, uh, you know, um, constrict not constricted, but confined in the sense that it's 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 up to member states to decide whether there should be a new convention deliberated, and then they um, they move forward with that process. In terms of the extent to which um, to which the current system caters to youth, that is that is what I was kind of trying to to give a bit of a glimpse into and some information on through my presentation. I think there are a lot of mechanisms, but I think honestly, if you look at them, probably um, the system, the human rights system and the human rights mechanisms are not as focused on the rights of young people uh, as they could be. Um, one specific example I could give is, you know, if you think about and maybe this is not necessarily the case specifically for Cyprus, but you know there are many countries uh, in the world where currently they have a huge youth population. So you know there's 30, 40, 50 uh, plus percent of the population is under 30 or 35 or even 40 years old. Um, so if if you take 
the um, recommendations coming out of the human rights system for those countries, I think it would be interesting to analyze and think about to what extent do these recommendations reflect that large youth population. Um, I haven't actually sat down to do that analysis, but my guess would be that they don't necessarily um, reflect or acknowledge that uh, to the extent that they could. Um, so I think you know there are there are protections until the age of uh, of 18 uh, covered by the child rights convention and those protections obviously no longer exist um, afterwards which which can sometimes leave a gap for young people uh, there is certainly more that that the human rights system can do and i would actually go back to what menelas was saying before about youth participation i think one of the ways in which you can address that is really by ensuring that there is adequate youth participation um, across the board and that also includes uh, in human rights uh, mechanisms in human rights uh, systems in when for example cyprus or x or y or z country is being reviewed um, by an expert committee or has its universal periodic review coming up uh, really making sure that uh, young people and youth organizations are involved in the discussions around that what are their human what are their key concerns in relation to exercising their human rights as young people um, what would they like to see changed and how can they be involved um, as partners to to facilitate that change I think there is a lot of um, room for progress there in terms of the involvement of young people um, in, in in those processes uh, and I think ultimately that is one of the one of the ways in which uh, the human rights system can better address um, uh, the rights of youth. Of course, I think we cannot just uh, just put it on young people to to make sure that the system addresses their their needs and their rights. I think that's one part, important part of the equation because it's about youth participation. But I think another important element is to make sure that you know the people who are in those positions. So the human rights committees um, and the member states, when they're reviewing other member states, they also think about posing questions or posing recommendations on youth and asking what is the situation with regards to youth in your country? Um, what are young people saying? What are some of the rights, the challenges they face vis-a-vis -vis their rights? And what are you doing in order to address those? Um, so yeah, I think in uh, in short, there's, there's a number of ways uh, to address that. One is through youth participation and the other is through making sure that youth uh, is mainstreamed throughout the system, um, which has been an effort over the last years, but I think there's always more that can be done, and hopefully, with the youth strategy, now this is always a good, this is also a way to give um, the UN, us, and and colleagues across the UN system an extra push to say this is not just you know an option or an added extra. It's something you should be doing, and that is a system wide effort to uh, to to give more attention to this. Thanks. So thank you so much both. Uh, thank you both, George and Menelaos. I think after this very insightful, uh, your very insightful presentation and this very important event, I'm sure that we have raised awareness regarding youth rights even more in Cyprus. And I'm sure that a lot of youth organizations will work further on the agenda of youth rights. And I'm sure the youth board as well and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the minister in his uh, speech uh, promoted a very important role of uh, young people in the UN system. So we're very hopeful that we will raise um, in the level youth participation even, even further. So allow me to thank you very much. And allow me also to thank our supporters for this event, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of, of Cyprus and the Cyprus Youth Council, as well as, as our sponsors, the Youth Board of Cyprus, and of course, Cyprus News Agency for being our media sponsor. Now we're going to proceed um, via Zoom to a workshop that we want to hear the, the young people's opinion and ideas about the United Nations we want. You can find all information on our Facebook page and uh, website if you would like to participate. Again, thank you so much all. Thank you, Manelaos. Thank you, George. Stay safe and keep fighting for youth rights. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.